and welcome to the second event in the Development Market Society. Um, so thank you all for being here. We're going to be here for about an hour. My name is Melissa Mara Obro. I'm from Ghana, and I'm a general course student here studying economics with a focus on development. Um, today, we want to talk about the topic of emerging markets investing, African sovereign debt. And I think this um, topic in particular is very important to discuss at this time as many African countries are pursuing debt restructuring um, and, are, and have their financial like, situations being exacerbated by the pandemic and the pandemic's costs. Um, today's speaker is very qualified to speak on the subject today. He is um, an emerging markets fund uh, manager at m and Investments. And prior to doing this, he worked with the World Bank for over a decade, working in East Asia and Africa in particular. Um, he's a quantitative economist. He holds a PhD from the University of Nottingham. And his interests include looking at how we could restructure debt um, sustainably and doing so um, on the African continent. Um, it is my ex like I'm super excited to be here in this talk, and I hope you are as well. And I'm really pleased to invite Mr. Beverly Smith to share with us all the things on this topic. Thanks, Vanessa. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, there's a okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a big, okay. There we go. And yeah. So what what I'm this since it's a, a small and informal audience say feel free to interrupt me at any time to ask a question to tell me you don't agree with something I say just or to start a conversation I'll be really happy about that so I've come here with like various hats so I'm, my day job is that it's in about two kilometers away in the city I manage an emerging markets bond fund where we can invest in about 90 countries debt in their local currency or in or in dollars or euros so we invest in countries there are as advanced, let's say, as Hungary or Romania, all the way down to very small and developing countries. Um, and that's what I spend my day doing, crunching the economics, looking at the politics, trying to understand global markets and making some decisions for our funds. But I've also written this book on African debt. It's, it's, it should be, you guys should all be able to access it for free via Oxford University Press through the portal, and I hope it's useful in your studies, basically. And what I'll do today is sort of talk to those two things, and I'll go through things fairly quickly, but if you'd like some further depth on anything to shout out, and, and, and I'll do that either then and there or in the Q&A. Um, so what I wanted to talk about first was... Um, is emerging and frontier market investing. And I'm going to start introducing some jargon. And again, if you don't understand something, let me know and I'll try and communicate in plain English. But basically, finance to me is, is mostly simple. And when it's complicated, people are either trying to hide something or it's just in a different language. So for the most part, once, it's, you know, once you've learned that foreign language, finance isn't that complicated. But what I'll try to do today is to point to some of the words. And so the words we use a lot are emerging and frontier market investing. And I notice you guys are the developing country society. And that could be anything from the poorest country on the planet to probably not including Finland. And you're going to draw a line somewhere and say these countries are developing, these are developed. Same in emerging markets. It started off as a, a branding tool for one of the big banks to say these are the markets you don't normally look at. These are emerging. And I think, I think it was actually first coined by someone at the IFC, part of the World Bank. But it's become popular as a term for countries that are investable, but not basically in Europe, not America, and not in Western, um, main Western developed markets. And then Frontier is introduced for those countries that, that, where the markets are a bit less developed and where investors can look to go. And I guess the periphery of that is countries where you can't invest very easily internationally. And, and so most of the countries you look at, I suppose, will be maybe a mixture. Some will be frontier markets and developing countries, and some will be perhaps aid-dependent and poorer that don't have access to those flows. So defining that 
for us, it's about 90 countries. And then just quickly, I wanted to talk about the different asset classes. So there's stocks and shares, equities. There's local market bonds, and that's Ghanaian SEBI bonds. It's bonds in Kenyan shillings. Um, it's, it's the local currency domestic law bonds. And then we've got international bonds. And these are typically denominated in dollars, um, can be denominated in euros or yen. And these are actively traded here in London. And the city of London is one of the major centers for trading emerging market bonds in the world. So some of the biggest trades will happen right down the road from here in those bonds. And then we've got private investment. And the word private is there to mean it's not traded, it's not listed on an exchange. All of these equities and bonds are listed on exchanges where private investment is putting money directly into a firm. And then we've got some blended investment, which is a mixture of public money through the likes of the World Bank, the African Development Bank. And then we've got overseas aid, which is essentially giving money away in the form of concessional loans and grants. So all of these things are different ways of investing, let's say, in emerging and frontier markets. Um, my experience is mainly in the funds, but people, if people have got questions on the others, I can do my best as well. Um, and up front, I just wanted to put this slide in because I remember when I was studying my masters, I was very interested in developing countries and I did an economics and development um, study and someone came and did a talk and it's very important to me. And I just wanted to flag that up front. And it was this ODI fellowship scheme, and that's a think tank um, that's um, here in London. And when I was straight out of university, they sent me to work in the Ugandan Ministry of Finance. So if anyone's interested in being an economist abroad, I really recommend having a look at the ODI fellowship scheme. It's, it's a, and, and doing some research there. And then the other thing, that I wanted to plug up front was the Young Professionals Program at the World Bank. And the World Bank is a big beast in Washington, D.C., but it's got offices all over the world. And they've got really good jobs for all sorts of profiles, from water engineers, economists, environmental specialists. And, and so those were the things that, that, that helped me out in my career, and I think they're both worth looking at. But when I think about emerging markets and developing economies, these are the jobs in government, in financial markets, where I am now, international organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, consultancy firms, think tanks, and academia. So there's a whole range of people thinking about developing countries in different ways. Um, but whatever hat you wear, I think you can agree that investment is needed in developing economies. I think when you, you can either look at the sustainable development goals and those many, many targets, and you, you see countries ranked from Finland and Sweden down to some of the poorest countries, and you see a massive gap, a massive development gap. So most people would agree development is needed and investment is needed in that development. And then when you travel in countries, you, you see it. You see the infrastructure is needed, you see a glaring gap, and so I think, and, and different people in different backgrounds will may perhaps disagree on that sometimes on how that investment is delivered. But I think the starting point for me is always that how do we get capital from richer countries, from global markets, to developing countries, so it can pro eventually provide better standards of living. And that's so. Whenever I think about debt, I'm, I'm thinking about debt problems not about solving debt problems at the end, but solving debt problems in a way of achieving investment flows. Um, and this, is a, this chart is about some of the financial flows. And I remember um, the 1980s and 90s, if you read the history books, are pretty bad for a lot of developing countries, particularly for um, African countries who endured some pretty tough structural adjustment programs and economic growth was flat, livelihoods were frozen. These were really tough years. And one of the outcomes of, of the 1980s and early 90s were, was a massive debt load. And so when I was growing up, I remember watching things on television about this debt load, this burden that was holding back people's ability to, to live better lives. 
So it was very much there. And as we approached the millennium in 2000, there were a lot of campaigns here in London. People were protesting on the street for debt relief to what, you know, third world or developing countries. So at my university at the time, people were doing all sorts of demonstrations to try and push the government to, to force debt relief. That was a massive thing in the late 90s. And, and it took a little bit of time, but there was, was a massive debt relief called the Heavily Indebted Poor Countries Initiative in the early 2000s that helped a lot of countries reduce their debt load. And what we've seen is um, a sort of return to those debt levels. And one of the tricky parts is when debt relief was given, there was this idea aid would double, aid would treble. There's a, a few prominent economists at the time, one called Jeffrey Sachs, who, who wrote with um, Bono, a pop star, that they would times aid by six. Aid would grow and grow and double and treble, and all this money would flow to countries. But that just hasn't happened. And when you see this, this, um, this bit in the middle, the Y bar, you kind of see these promises were made here, but aid as a proportion of GDP for developing countries has dropped a little bit. These countries have been growing, aid has been static or dropping, but aid hasn't been, hasn't been delivered in anything like the volumes that were promised. What ha you know, the other one was FDI. There was gonna be lots of um, investment in developing countries. And while this has done better, it hasn't been a game changer at about 1% of GDP, 1% of um, a country's out, um, annual output on average. What has been a surprise is worker remittances. And this wasn't talked about much then, but this is the success of exporting talent. Countries all over the world, there's really bright people that have come to work in London, gone to work in New York, and they are sending money home to their families. And that has been incredibly powerful for a lot of developing countries I go to. So, in summary, after the big debt relief, we didn't get enough aid, we didn't get enough investment. Yes, we did well in worker remittances, but there was an investment gap, a capital gap. So countries have borrowed to try and get that capital. And one, one of the things in the book I do is I, I sort of split the hard thing about writing about Africa is it's 55 countries, um, all so very different. While there are themes that connect different countries, it's really hard to, to summarize. And, and whenever you do make sweeping statements about a continent, you're missing a lot of um, important characteristics. But one typology that's helped me is a kind of definition of emerging Africa which are the large economies of Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt, and to that list I add the smaller economies of Morocco and Mauritius on the basis that they've got higher per capita income. And these countries are countries where they can come to the market a bit easier than the other countries. They're much more advanced. If you've been lucky enough to travel in those countries where at least the capital cities are advanced and, and good things are happening, on paper there, their economies are much larger. And these economies, um, we've seen a big increase in debt between 2010 and 2019, pretty much over the last 10, 12 years. I haven't put data for 2022 yet because it, there's, it comes out as a lag for the world, from the World Bank. But one thing you notice about their debt stocks is some of it comes from multilaterals, which is World Bank, etc. A little bit comes from bilateral creditors, which is other countries lending. And an important new lender on the scene has been China over the last 10 years. And then private creditors, which is borrowing in the bond market at home and abroad. And you see a lot of the big increase in African debt is attributed to these five or six large emerging markets. And then the frontier Africa definition is the countries that I knew as aid dependent and developing 15 years ago that have come into the markets, often for the first time in the last 15 and this is Kenya, this is Ghana, this is Ivory Coast, this is Senegal, this is um, countries that are still getting concessional aid money. They're still developing by many yardsticks, but they've got that, um, they've got that access to new capital. And so these countries have seen their debt soar as well. They've borrowed a lot during this period. And, in, and this is about 18 countries. 
and then the remaining countries in Africa are either poor or prudent, and they haven't had access to the markets. For most of those countries, it's Central African Republic, Sierra Leone, um, Malawi. They haven't had the economic numbers, the ability to tap the markets. They've remained dependent on aid. And in that buffer are a few prudent countries which don't need to borrow, like Botswana. But they're a small, different type of country given their diamond wealth. So we've got so so this typology has really helped me in in sort of breaking down the spectrum of African debt. So when we start thinking about solutions, where you've got to start thinking who are you trying to help and what problems are you trying to fix. And I argue that solutions for poor countries, frontier and emerging Africa need to be very different. And, and that's why I, I set them out in that manner. <clears throat> and what, what I've had the luxury of doing, especially with working with the World Bank, was an ability to travel to lots of countries and live in different countries. I've, I've lived in Uganda, Tanzania, um, in Zambia and in Zimbabwe. I've traveled to 26 African countries as part of the book's research, meeting government officials, and that's really helped. And I think that's been really helpful to get, a, hopefully, a more granular understanding. And a lot of that travel in work time, that's the Angola Central Bank. So, you know, you fly, you get taken in a nice taxi to a nice hotel, you, you eat there, and you get taken to a nice meeting in a boardroom in the Central Bank. And you can go away from that with quite an impression, but it can be quite different to how 99.9% .9 of people might live in that country. And so what's also important is to, to, to sort of understand what's going on outside the government architecture and, and in the country. You know, for most of the African countries I've been to recently, the median age is about 18, which means that half the population is, hasn't even had a chance to vote yet. So there's going to be massive changes with these sorts of demographics. When you've got population growth of 2.5%, 3%, incredible things happen because the population is doubling every 25 years so these sorts of these sorts of numbers are, are pretty amazing and so you you also you also need to get out and, and one of the things you've got to do is sort of get out and that that's where I used to ride my bike in Zambia before work and that's only about 20 kilometers outside the city and it's a sort of stark reminder about how different life is for different people both and you could say the same about London I suppose but I think it's particularly important in these developing countries where you compare what life's like in the, the the square mile of skyscrapers in a capital to to how people live in, in rural areas so with that study what I've tried to do in diagnosing debt problems is to get underneath that debt problem and try and work out what's going on and what's more common is that you see that countries have got investment problems. They've borrowed money from the markets, they've borrowed money from another country, they've, been, they've got an aid loan from the World Bank, and they haven't made the best possible decision. They've either picked the wrong infrastructure, they've not paid sufficient attention to the quote, there could have been corruption, but the investment hasn't happened as well as it could. There's inefficiency there. So we've got the capital flowing, but the investment hasn't delivered, and therefore it hasn't created the revenues and the growth in order to pay the debt back. So for a lot of countries, they haven't really got a debt problem, I argue, they have an investment problem about quality of investment. And um, partly that is because the 80s and 90s, at least, were, were pretty horrible. They shut down choices. Governments had to sack people there were no, you couldn't dream because you didn't have budgets. Budgets were getting smaller. So suddenly when debt relief happened, choices came very quickly and there weren't the systems in place. So if you travel to a more established middle income country like Colombia, they have a ministry of planning, they have a system for vetting different government proposals for investment, they have skilled staff in cost benefit analysis, they have um, an online portal where you can see a pipeline of government projects. But when you go to some countries in Africa, that just doesn't exist. They haven't got the skills and institutions yet to have delivered on, on these choices. A lot of countries are working hard on this, 
but they're, they're not good enough. So under a debt problem, you often see an investment problem. Um, the other problem I see is a revenue problem, whereby you're borrowing and investing, but the, the government has to pay that money back, but the government isn't earning enough money in revenue. So, and that, the measure I use for that is sort of domestic revenue as a percent of GDP. And if it's a, a certainly low level, it, you know there's going to be a problem in the future. So, and partly is some African countries are really hard to tax because the informality of the economy. So if you're not, if, you, if your government's borrowing and it's not taxing, it's not getting a revenue stream in order to pay its debt back. So everyone hates taxes, but if you're going to deliver on public service and investment at some point, you need taxes, and that's a really difficult bind, particularly you know, for any government. And um, but, but underneath many debt problems are revenue problems. And then the other one I want to look at is export earnings to foreign exchange shortage problems, and that's when you're borrowing in someone else's currency. So the UK tends to borrow in pounds. America borrows in dollars. The eurozone countries borrow in euros, the, their own currency. But for a lot of countries. It's difficult because you're forced to borrow in someone else's currency, which you can't own. And that creates massive mismatches. So in the late 90s, a lot of Asian countries went into a crisis. But since then, countries like Indonesia, countries like the Philippines, countries, and to some extent in Latin America, have borrowed at home. They've stopped that external borrowing and have borrowed in their own currency. And that's made them less vulnerable to global crises. But a lot of countries at the developing end of the spectrum are kind of forced still to borrow in dollars and euros. So this year, we've seen massive dollar strength. So if you go on holiday anywhere, the pound's really weak, but, but the dollar is incredibly strong. And that's meant debt problems have, have exacerbated for many countries. So underneath the debt problem is this mismatch between what a country is earning from its exports and um, the debt the external currency it needs to pay. And so all three of these problems I see in many countries. Some sadly have one or two of those problems, but I think by delving into what's the root cause of the debt problem, it makes for a better diagnosis. And to put some names to it, so right now I'd say Zambia, who defaulted in 2020, was an investment problem. I'd say Ghana, which is struggling now, is a revenue problem. And I'd say Ethiopia, who's having problems, is a classic example of an F FX shortage, and we can and place many countries into these categories. But when I also do my research for work and for the book, you also need, need to look at weak growth, a country that where the, the, the is not growing fast enough, many unclear liabilities, and this is where the sovereign balance sheet gets complicated. Is there a state-owned airline that's making a loss? Is there a state-owned electricity utility that's making a loss? that isn't on the government balance sheet now, but if they need bailing out in future, they will come onto the government balance sheet. So these unclear liabilities can come and get you. And then financial sector weakness. The worst form of debt crises is where it hits the banks as well. These are the most expensive to fix. So if there are financial sector weaknesses, you can, you can guess that if a debt crisis did come, the, the cost would be exorbitant for government. So, and, and just to sort of put it in perspective, so the, the three big changes to the, the debt landscape for developing countries and African countries over the last 10 years have been, we got a load of debt relief, so our debt was really low, and then we got new choices. And the new choices in borrowing came from new bilaterals that became lenders like China, but also many countries in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, UAE have all lent as countries. And then we've got this access to markets. And when we look at African countries, if we go back to these years in the early 2000s, there was very little African debt trading in London in global markets. Only a few countries had come to market. But what we've seen is this massive change over the last 10 years and a big scale up of African borrowing, but not just African borrowing, but many frontier developing countries. To, to a much bigger size of about 25 billion a year in 2018 and 19, a bit of slowdown during the pandemic, 
but there's this been this this opportunity for the first time in many decades, for the first time in some countries' histories, to tap global markets. And, and this is something that is under threat at the moment as global interest rates rise. And people are debating whether it needs to be preserved and saved or it's something that shouldn't happen. And this really divides opinions at the moment. And where we're left is some countries have borrowed a little bit and some countries have borrowed a lot. And at the top of this list, you know, in African countries, Egypt's the biggest borrower, followed by South Africa and Nigeria. But as I said earlier, these are also the biggest economies. So another way to look at borrowing is to compare it to the size of the economy. And then a different number of giants come out. Ghana, Senegal, Gabon, Ivory Coast, Zambia have all borrowed a lot in relative to the size of their economies from the markets. And so you, you've got different challenges on either side. So um, there's a whole, I've kind of written two chapters on this, how countries came into the market for the first time, and also later in the book on, um, on what the challenges are now. Um, okay, so the big thing at the moment is, is spreads, and this is financial jargon, which I'll just take a moment to explain. So when you, when you look at a bond, you talk about its yield a lot, which talks about how much you as a, earn as an investor. But that's also a proxy of how much it costs the government to borrow. So yields are very important in financial markets. If yields are high, it's very expensive for governments to borrow. When yields are low, it's, it's, it's more affordable. And what we see is we've seen some spikes during the global financial crisis. But yields have been at reasonable levels that have allowed African countries into the markets. But recently with COVID, and this year on account first of the war, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, then Fed, the Federal Reserve's hiking interest rates, but also the fear of a US recession, have led to this massive increase in, in borrowing costs that put us above this 10% line, which for me is a line where, hang on, are we really going to have market access in the future? So maybe this mountain drops down here and everything's fine, but maybe it persists, and that's the debate in financial markets. I think even as we, we, we chat now, the, the Federal Reserve's presenting its latest decision, and this is being hotly debated. So people are, making, people are trying to work out if this is a temporary blip in borrowing costs and will come down to more sustainable levels, or, is, or are, we, are we going into an era where it's going to be very difficult to finance debt. And I think wherever you, um, wherever you sit on the, of what comes next, you can sort of look back at the last 10 years and you can think, wow, there were some really quick and big borrowing decisions made. And there's some element of success in that, but there's also some element of worry. And the sort of the, what I like to present is that we basically did racing around in that red sports car on really bad roads. So that it's been impressive in terms of speed, it's been quite exciting, but it's a one that we haven't crashed already. You know, that you, you, and, and I think what we need to be doing is shifting into a sort of a method of borrowing that's more robust. So I, I sort of see problems with the last 10 years, but I'll argue that we still need that investment. So we need a vehicle that is right for the roads. And that's the analogy of the Hilux there. And that's because I think we do need progress with the Sustainable Development Goals. And we've got a whole load of work for climate change adaptation. We've got a whole load of work for some climate change mitigation on the continent and in developing countries. Unless we have private finance, it's going to be very difficult because I don't see governments stumping up bigger aid budgets. You know, in fact, it's in the reverse in the UK. You know, the aid budget just gets smaller and smaller. So my view, at least, is that I can clearly see we had the wrong vehicle over the last 10 years, but it's not about parking it on the side of the road. It's sort of transitioning into something more robust. Um, and I've just got two more slides, and then we'll, we'll have a conversation. And, and the book talks about better borrowing. And the first part is about the borrowers, what the borrowers can do. And this is conversations with, with governments. And it's 
deliver on debt transparency, and this is to produce your own data, put it on your website, do your own reports, and own the narrative, communicate. Because if you don't publish that data and information, people create a narrative for you. So I think debt transparency is crucial um, to better borrowing. Deepen domestic markets, which means borrowing more in your own currency than, than foreign currencies, which is not as easy done as it is said, but it's still important to have part of a strategy. Um, the next one is under discussion at the moment, is more flexible financing. So bond contracts whereby if we do have a pandemic or we do have a deep recession or if we do have a hurricane, the bond contracts allow a breathing space for countries to hold off payments. So some more flexible financing that doesn't sort of bind countries when they're in really difficult spots. And then I think we also need some market access parachutes, which, and by that I mean for countries that can't get market access for a moment because markets are in too bad a state, that there's some support and some concession from the likes of the World Bank. But in exchange for those sorts of concessions, we need tighter use of proceeds. And that means spending money much better, not just borrowing a billion dollars on the market to spend generally, but for specific quality investment. And I think the countries that are going to deliver on that will need not only a solid plan, but a sustainable brand. Like I'm under pressure for all my funds to be invested in sustainable means under a the jargon of ESG, which means environment, social, and governance. So not only to pursue a financial return, but to pursue a, an environmental good, a social or a governance good. And I think countries on the other side that can build that sustainable brand will be able to attract that, that better capital. And so these are the, the many things I talk about with countries about what needs to happen to shift to that better vehicle. So there's no silver bullet and there's a load of hard yards, but but that's what I, and, and in the book, that's a chapter on better borrowing. And I'll do one more slide and then we'll, we'll switch to a conversation. And I think on the other side for lenders, I was in DC, Washington DC two weeks ago for the IMF meetings and I did a talk at the World Bank. And I think the key thing I find at the moment is, I think lenders sometimes think they're this fish and we think we're lending to a country and we've got a good plan and a good agreement. But in reality, there's a big swarm of fish. And we all think our one loan is fine. But if we add up all of our loans, there's too much debt. So there's a problem there. And what happens after that is everyone points fingers at everyone else. The US blames China. China blames the US. It's suddenly evil Western banks. And then suddenly it's... Um, people who haven't done their calculations, and there's this circle of pointing, which to me doesn't lead to any sort of constructive conversation about how to do better, how to fix it. So there needs to be sort of less finger pointing, a more understanding and working with other debtors and creditors. And I think if we can get that forum, we will be able to support these developing country borrowers better to use that investment well and also borrow with greater purpose. But it's tricky at the moment because global geopolitics are difficult. So for a long time, the debt conversation happened in Paris, in a thing called the Paris Club. And that was built pretty much out of necessity. It was just a group of rich country creditors got together and said, look, rather than point fingers at us over the last 10 years, let's, let's sit down and work out things out together. And this, this really did work well in the 90s. But new creditors have come in and um, China is not a member of the Paris Club. Many of the Gulf countries are not a member of the Paris Club. So it becomes complicated to do these debt workouts. And then equally, um, there was an effort, at least during the pandemic, to use the G20, because the G20 was this beast would, would, would work. It would go everyone around the table. And then suddenly, in, since February of this year, Russia has invaded Ukraine and is suddenly persona non grata. So do we, do we have a G19? I've lost, tra I've lost track of that. But these forums are complicated and difficult. And while America and China are debating about trade and about Taiwan, how can we sit together and have a practical discussion about debt? It becomes complicated. And one thing I find is that, you know, I've, I've had, I've, I've traveled to China and I've 
been lucky enough to talk with Chinese academics and Chinese government officials and Chinese ambassadors in African countries. And I think there is, there's a, there is a willingness on most parties to think through and improve these things. And I think the, but it gets sort of tainted by this, this global finger pointing. And I think there are a lot of bright people that can fix this, but it's just difficult at the moment to get them in one room. Um, so on that, on that, like, on that less optimistic note, I'll, I'll stop and, and first wonder if there are any questions and quite happy to go back to any points I've made if that's helpful. Yeah, it's the, so I think there are there are pure you could take a really simple project like building as a if you go to Nairobi at the moment, it's um from the airport to the centre of town they've built this road on stilts and they've put it up over the last eighteen months and I travelled it for the first time in I think it was May this year. And this project is bankable, inverted commas, which could you pay a toll? So this, the idea of this project is that constructors come in and build it, and then with tolls over 10 years, this thing is bankable, and it doesn't cost the government any money. So there's that sort of public-private partnership, which in theory is wonderful. But then I've been to many African countries where a politician, after a few years, has said, no one should pay road tolls anymore. And they're very popular, but suddenly that project isn't bankable anymore, and it, it joins the government balance sheet. So I've driven on many toll roads where the tolls aren't being collected. So you, you so you've got that end of the spectrum, but but then and then you've got stuff government should be doing. So like you know, if we've got this half the population is under eighteen, we need high quality education, and that's not really bankable. It's important, and it will create a return for the country and the generations to come. But but the, so that and that might actually have as much social as economic. So defining what investments are right for a country is tricky. Only the, so some of which is social benefit, some of which is economic benefit. And I can give you examples of pure economics, but most of the time it's a mixture of social and economic benefit. And I think that's why there's a massive role for the public sector to deliver those public goods that are necessary, but they've got to either pay for them out of their budget, which is tricky, or borrow in order to invest. And so it becomes it becomes tricky and what's strange is that as I travel there's some really world-class projects in countries and some real awful decisions in from the same government in sometimes the same town and that's always a paradox and you know that they have you know that you might see this wonderful dam that's generating electricity that's going to serve the population for the next 30 years and then the same year they built a road to nowhere that connects no communities and it's just a waste of money. So it's it's difficult. But I think what hasn't been emphasized enough is building these systems for public investment management, the skills and the institutions that will help government make better decisions. Yeah, so it's, um, but that's a really, and I think there's, there's a lot of good academic work on that. But it's tricky. I know that in, in this country, some public investment is good, some is less good. Same, you know, even the, I think Berlin Airport's one of the best case studies of a failed public investment and if the Germans can't get it right, it must be difficult. So you kind of, you, you know, it's no easy task. Yeah, um, before I start to hand to the top, and Paul. Yeah. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. And uh, I had a question about the slide with the African spread yeah. for African bonds. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, and the graph, 
right, especially recently. So as the U.S. interest rates have been going up, yeah. so have been the yields on equity bonds. Yeah. So I'm wondering what kind of mechanisms are there for this propagation? Like, why are there, why are there correlated? Okay, that's a great question. So America kind of rules the world, whether you like it or not, especially in financial markets. And the Federal Reserve isn't just making decisions, well, it, it, for US interest rates, has massive implications for all of us all over the world. Um, so a lot of global trade is tied to the dollar. A lot of um, financial transactions are tied to the dollar. So it's, so basically there's, so there's, there's two things happening at the moment. The US is increasing its interest rates, but at the same, you know, because it's trying to combat its inflation, and we've, but we've also got this fear there might be a US recession in a year, maybe six months. Will they get the soft landing right or will they hike too much and, and send the economy crashing down? So, so basically what happens in those instances, higher interest rates in America means money goes there. And when we're scared about things, there's flight to safety, money goes there. So basically 2019 when there were much lower or not, they don't look, there's a big difference between two and four. A lot of money was being invested in emerging markets, but when America's hiking, the dollar's stronger and there's this flight to safety, people don't want to take risk. So they're risk averse and they pull back their money there. Animal spirits are dented. And so there's less people wanting to invest in Panama. There's less people wanting to invest in Colombia or Kenya because they've got that risk aversion. And the good things about these episodes is that they tend to be short, but for those months, no one wants to invest in emerging markets. And so the cost of the, the yields go up. And the reason is, so with bonds are traded, so if people are buying them, the price goes up and the yield drops. But if people are selling them, the price goes down and the yield goes up. It's just a simple mechanic. And so but the, the thing to take away is that the Federal Reserve is not only setting its own interest rate, but that of the globe. And higher global interest rates are, are a kind of worry for financial markets. And when financial markets are worried, they don't want to take risk. If that helps. Yeah. On that same note, how much worse can it get? Like right now you're sort of seeing uh, that like interest rate differential depending on what, what's driving it. Like you look at the RAL or the peso, and, Currency strong against the dollar this year because of like strong uh, central banking policies and, and good differentials. But if you start to get that shift more towards flight to safety, recession fears, I mean, probably sometime next year, how much worse can it get for, for EM when you start having not only the issues with, with high interest rates in the US, but also currency devaluations because of that, like flight to safety? Um, so this. So what, what, what you start, so when, when, these, so when these sort of dark clouds are over the markets, they, markets tend to, to go very quiet. There's, not, there's very little trading and there's no, one, there's no new bonds, come, no one's really coming to the market. So this year, it's been exceptionally quiet for people putting new bonds in the market. So then with that, you're like, who has the greatest financing needs? So for example, what the markets will be doing is scouring the, the countries and the companies and say, who needs to come to market in December? Who's got a large bond maturing? So for example, Pakistan on the 5th of December has to pay a billion dollars back. So the question is, if they can't come and do a new bond and refinance that, how are they gonna find a billion dollars? Are they going to be able to repay? So most countries have FX reserves, foreign currency reserves, for these sorts of problems. So you start thinking, they might pay December, but then when's their next bond? Oh, it's in June. Will Pakistan be able to afford to pay that bond? And so, that, so, that, so what the market is doing on how bad it can get, it's thinking, let's say markets are closed for all of 2023. Who is going to be caught out? Who's not going to have, who is that access going to hurt the most? And you look at what debt's maturing, and then you look at um, what foreign exchange reserves people have got as a buffer. Uh, a good example at the moment is Egypt. 
So Egypt's a country where they've got a lot of debt, they've got maturities coming up, but they've also got a lot of support. So the IMF's just given them a new program. So as well as FX reserves, the IMF is going to lend them another three billion. That would be there. And then the Gulf countries, who are flush with oil dollars, said, if you get an IMF program, I'll help you out too. I'll, I'll, I'll put some FDI, some foreign direct investment, in your state coffers. So suddenly you, you start thinking, OK, yeah, Egypt, it looks tricky, but they're getting support from these different entities. So the question is, if the markets are shut for 2023, there's a few countries that are exposed, but a lot of countries are kind of OK. But the question would be if you start thinking, what if they're closed in 2024 and 2025? And then you can start dreaming about sovereign debt crises and multiple countries not being able to pay their debts. And that's where it, but, but, and then you, and you have to sort of, there's nothing in history that will tell you you're right or wrong, but you, you have to make that judgment. Where the market has settled, and the market gets things wrong all the time as a herd, is that probably sometime next year the Fed pivots and starts cutting rates. But they may have got that completely wrong. You know, time will tell. So the, the question for a lot of this is, this, you know, we're up at 4%. Are we going back to 2.7, which was the average before? Or are we going to stay at 4? Or are we going to end up at 6? Like the 19, you know, people start talking a lot about the 1970s, where there was an inflationary crisis, rates were put up, they came down, and then, and that's where the EM crisis of the 1980s happened, because the Fed put rates through to 22%. You know, whole different magnitude. So a lot of commentary in the media at the moment is, are we going into a 1980s style debt crisis? And at the moment, it's a concern and a worry rather than everyone thinks it's going to happen. But all of this, these are really good and prominent questions, which I think no one has clear answers to. Yeah. Hey, um, thanks, thanks so much for the talk. It's very insightful. Um, I have a question with regards to the lender side. So after all, emerging market debt is an asset on an investor's portfolio. Yeah. So how does this kind of, how, how does, what do you think the role of emerging market debt is to all these sorts of different sorts of investors? And how does this interact with the quality and access of debt these countries can get? Um. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. So, the, so when you when you hold a bond, you you have a it's like an IOU. It's a promise to be repaid. So you have to have trust in that. It's not you you some uh, ten years in the future, you're going to get this money back, and along the way, you're going to get some interest payments and coupons each year. It's just a promise. So you have that asset, but it's still only a promise. It's not gold bars in a stack. It's it's a piece of paper that says you will be repaid and that requires faith so these things so bond contracts trade every day every hour in London so they're being repriced so at the end of each day you you're repricing so your your asset can also change depending on what it's worth same as if you buy stocks in the S&P 500 one day it's worth 100 next day it's worth 98 next day it's 104 you, you, you know, your assets change with that. So, and I think, so I think that's one thing. So the, it is good to hold this debt, but the, I think one of the problems with markets are in these types of problems that they freak out a bit too much. They're not calm, long-term partners. One day they're ready to lend you the billions you need and the next day nothing. And that's the problem. It's too flighty, it's too jumpy. So, for developing countries, what would be the dream would be someone providing you with a load of money that was calm and stable so that you could invest over, over many years and therefore you can deliver things to your people. But the reality is someone's ready to lend one year and they're ready to take all that money back another year. So you've kind of got, you're kind of forced to use the markets because there's no long-term calm capital. Is that, is that help? But would you say there's like a natural buyer of emerging market debt or some sort? So there is, but it's too small. So there's, there are a lot, so when you're in the, you, when you invest in a fund, you've got multi-asset funds, 
you've got fixed mandates. So some people have, like, some pensions and things are invested in, um, my funds has to be in emerging markets by the book. If, if, if people put money in, it's because it's going to emerging markets. You can't make any other decision. So, so what this is called is dedicated emerging market money. Then there's a whole load of money which is sometimes in EM, sometimes not. If it gets called in the city tourist money sometimes because it comes in and out, and sometimes you could call it multi-asset money. So on my trading floor, there are people who, some, when there's an opportunity in the M, they put their money in. When there's not, they stick it in shares in the US. They make a choice. So you've got a dedicated EM money and then crossover money. And at the moment, that crossover money is too scared. And that's why the yields are so high. But when the confidence requires in that crossover money, it'll come in. And, and so it's a funny industry where it's very flow driven if that makes sense. So while this risk aversion assists, that crossover money is not coming into emerging markets, and that's why these yields are sky high. Right. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, if we can go to the investor perspective, I think, what do you kind of look for when you invest in a particular you know, debt vehicle or a country, you know, more generally than an investor? So, so I think with any sovereign debt, the like, the one distinction I always make is if I meet people who invest in shares, they're really optimistic. They love upside. They're talking about growth and spectacular. When you talk to bond investors, we typically come across as very pessimistic, worried people. So we tend to look at, can a, is a country able to repay its debt? And is a country willing to pay its debts? Those two things. And so you can do some, there's a really good, one of my favorite academic papers is by um, a former chief economist of back called Carmen, Carmen Reinhardt. She wrote a paper, Debt Since Waterloo, and when was Waterloo, like 80, 1850, last 200 years or so. And she looked at why countries pay their debts back, because they could quite simply say no. You know, and but, but people, the countries do, and she said, despite wars, famines, problems, you make a 6% return if you invest in sovereign debt, regardless of all these defaults and problems we've had over the decades. So, um, so, but what you're trying to do is beat that 6% by picking the winners, I suppose, picking the countries that you think will perform better. And that could be that they're growing faster, that because they've got better, you know, more stable exports. It could be that they are running better fiscal policies and collecting revenue. And then, you know, you, you're just, so you but, but, but for a proper assessment of um, a country's ability to read debt, you probably need to look at the economics, you need to look at the politics, and then you need to look at social aspects as well. It probably needs to be a bit broader. And, and much more these days, um, governance and environmental risks. You know, if, if, if for example, if, if, with climate, change, climate, the climate emergencies, we're seeing greater propensity of floods, greater propensity of droughts, greater propensity of cyclone. So you need to be much more in tune about those types of shocks as well. So it's, it's a t it's, if it were easy and simple, they wouldn't, it would, yeah, it, it, there wouldn't be need, there's a lot of people working in that, trying to understand those, is a country able and willing to pay? And, and I guess that's what, that's what we're looking at. Um, and there's different approaches. Some people have a very quantitative approach. Some people are more qualitative about it. Some people are more, um, you know, they've, they've, they've got their own thoughts and ideas. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one, and, and many different investors will, will focus on different things, is the honest truth. Okay, so uh, thanks for your talk and examples. Like, my uh, focus is on the country Rwanda. Yeah. which Rwanda experienced a lot of economic growth pre-pandemic level under the control of Paul Kagame. But um, during the, uh, I think, on your graph, it also shows that uh, Rwanda borrowing is quite a high percentage of the GDP. Mm -hmm. But do you think, like, given the Rwanda high potential economy, will it be less risky to invest in Rwanda bonds? Or what do you think about Rwanda's future borrowing on the international market? Um, Rwanda's made some very good progress, but it's still a poor country by GDP per capita terms. It's still very aid dependent. 
And I think Rwanda, despite some governance concerns about the politics, attracts money from donors. They like the Rwanda story. They feel that they will, you know, the investing in Rwanda is good because it's achieving things. So Rwanda has a large debt stock as a percent of GDP, but most of their debt is actually very concessional. Their debt has very low interest rates, and it's to aid agency type lenders who are actually very kind when there are problems. So when I look at a debt stock, I not only look at the magnitude, but its composition. And the, I'd say the vast majority of Rwanda's debt stock is at extremely low interest rates. And it's not lumpy maturity, <coughs> it's paid back gradually. It has what's called a nice amortization profile. So there's not much, there's not, so no two debt stocks are the same. So first of all, and Rwanda just has its one bond trading in the market. So if Rwanda came and issued a second bond, a third bond, and a fourth bond, I'd start to get very worried. But actually so far, it's been fairly disciplined with its market access. So Rwanda is, yeah, so again, composition of debt is crucial to that assessment. And, and while Rwanda's growth is very important. It's still quite a poor country, is, is the other thing I noticed. And, you, you know, with Paul Kagame, he has achieved many things, but it's who political transition is a complete unknown if you look at it with a long enough lens. Thank you very much for your talk. I, um, having spent best part of my life over 50 years in living in Southern Africa, the standout player um, in terms of investment and, and debt on the ground is China uh, in most of Africa. And my question to you is, is this sort of bona fide legit debt being um, offered and invested in, in the of the continent by China, or is the establishment of um, uh, you know the use of, of, of minerals and natural resources as collateral for debt? Is there a more sinister agenda, in your opinion, um, sort of a, talking to the whole post-colonial um, narrative here? Um, you know, is this, is, is this a new kind of financial imperialism that we see developing? Um, China lending is a massively emotive topic. Um, I think there's a lot of rubbish written about it, but within it, there's some really good gems. So I think the first, my favorite book is The Dragon's Gift, which is a beautiful book about, it's quite dated now, but it, it tells a very good story of Chinese lending. And it's by a professor at John Hopkins University in, in the States who speaks Mandarin, who has traveled, and she has many, many Chinese PhD students. They've got a wonderful combination of, of worldview on debt plus um, knowledge of the Chinese policy banks. So my chapter, I think, comes out quite balanced. It's not, it's not a provocative view that China lending is terrible or China lending is wonderful. I think there's a whole spectrum I've seen some incredible world-class China investments and some very poor Chinese investments. And that's partly because China is not a, a unified lender. It has an aid agency who lends concessionally. It has policy banks, which are state-owned, but lend at reasonable cost. And then it has pure commercial players. And so to say every bank in London is the same would be a mistake. And I think the same in China, that every so China is a, it wants things for its international cooperation like any country. There are goals to aid beyond altruism, votes in the UN, collaboration on trade projects. But it, it just, it, but, it's, um, but, it's, but it's certainly, a lot of that is mutual advantage. And, and so you do see, you know, that a lot of these projects wouldn't have been built without China pitching up. The infrastructure investment went quite out of fashion with the World Bank and the African Development Bank. So there weren't many ways to get stadiums, roads, electricity grid built. But at the same time, could investment have been better? Yes. But you say that for a lot of projects. So the tricky part about Chinese lending is they've done it for a long time. 
They lent to Zambia in the 1970s, um, but they scaled up massively between 2010 and 2015. And China lending to peaks in 2015 with the PRI and then has quietened down a lot since then. So in Africa, it, this is this growth 2010 to 2015, and it's extremely concentrated in Ethiopia, in Kenya, in Zambia, and in Angola, with, and some smaller countries like Djibouti. But China investment grew rapidly, it peaked, and it's very concentrated. So Ghana has very little Chinese investment, where Zambia has a lot. So it's a tricky one. So again, um, <coughs> It's hard to not talk for hours on it, but, but on the whole, that I think the debt trap narrative is not is not founded on decent research. Personally, I've not seen enough evidence yet to buy into that. Um, but you know, I think a lot of people point to a, a port being moved on a lease in Sri Lanka. But when you read about that port, it's quite a special case, and it hasn't been repeated. And so it's it's a tricky one, and I think. I think Chinese, China needs to evolve as a creditor, and it needs to be a better creditor. But it's not all bad in my book. And what we need is a ton of good research on what's just happened to try and dig, dig deeper, I suppose. Um, kind of links to the question I was just asking. I said we were actually taking the time out to talk about this art, so question about predatory lending within the financial market. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like predatory lending, I suppose when we define it, it's like you know, you know, you. I guess it's sort of like payday lending in the UK, where people are paying exorbitant rates over over short terms. And I think um, it's. I think. When you're talking about like a, a firm lending to someone on low income, there's an element of unfairness if about that. But what, what a country needs to do is not sign those deals as well. So I think there is always a smart suit looking for profit. I think that to me is the my sad pessimistic view on the world. There are always people who are ready to take advantages of situations whether they work for commodities firms, whether they are, and, and typically these loans, like predatory lending tends to be short. Like predatory lending isn't a 30 year infrastructure loan because that's not, it, it's more of a quick buck if we define it like that. So I think the worst <coughs> parts in finance are secret deals under the table. And they tend to involve two, they, you always need two parties. You need an element in government who's stupid enough to accept it or willing to accept it for corrupt purposes and someone who's and you know these and we and the worst form of lending i've seen in africa over the last 10 years has put people in jail which is a good thing so the the lending to mozambique that happened behind closed doors they had two state-owned enterprises that promised to do um tuna fishing and these loans were made in complete secret and the money was completely <coughs> sold and since then both people on the transaction side and on government have gone to jail. So, but most lending, at least in my view, isn't predatory like that. It, it, it can be too expensive, it can be for the wrong project, but that doesn't make it predatory. It just makes it bad lending, and we want, I want lending to be better. And then I think the other part of finance that's not very nice is when, when countries go into default, a term you'll hear in vulture funds, and these are sorts of countries that will buy up debt at a, when it's, no one wants to hold it. And then they will aggressively pursue the government in court. And we haven't got to that stage yet because bond prices are not low enough. But when bond prices crashed in the 90s, you found all sorts of strange companies pitching up, trying to sue countries. And in the UK, we've improved legislation to protect against those funds. But my worry is if we do go into a doom and gloom scenario, then that will be a massive concern again. So it's it's difficult for these definitions, but I think yeah, I think you always need to be wary of it. But one thing I'll say about bonds in their defence is all the information is always public. They're listed on exchanges. 
what worries me more is the debt that we don't know about, the behind closed doors contracts that people won't make public. And if that's where I think the biggest mistakes can happen. But the minute you have to publish every contract, there's a chance that the, the worst ones will be picked up by good journalists and will have a debate. Kenya is a great example of a country where it's almost like debating debts and national sport. It's wonderful. You know, it's a real positive thing when people are like, what were the terms on that bridge? Why are we paying 8% for that? That, you know, that's bad debt. We shouldn't be doing that. And I think only when government gets pushed back like that will we get better outcomes. But transparency is massive. Anything that pushes for greater transparency to put debt contracts clearly in the open, I think will reduce the chances of predatory lending happening. But someone will always find a way in finance. There's always an evil portion that's ready to profit. Yeah, if you have, we'll be Yes, again, sir, thank you so much for your talk. I just want to quickly check my understanding of you, the uh, overarching argument in your book. Mm -hmm. So are you arguing on the one hand, there is this default risk, risk absolutely imposed by you know, rising interest rates in most credit countries. Yeah. But on the other hand, um, so if the private sector uh, goes in and participates in the investment, it will turn into a more robust structure for the overall, you know, in multiple countries in Africa in terms of their sovereign debt. And given the high yield spread it is currently having now, it's sort of a win-win situation for both if, if there is this private and public partnership uh, in this investment, in the sense of this sovereign debt investment. Um, I, th I think when you, when you take a country like um, Brazil, in emerging markets. There's no debate they should be in global financial markets, right? No one says, oh, Brazil should stop borrowing from anyone and just live quietly in its poor means. No one says that. Um, but when you get to a country like um, Nigeria, let's say, people are like, so there's this argument that maybe Nigeria shouldn't have done it, borrowed from the markets. Maybe Nigeria should just wait and get aid money. And, and keep things calm and quiet, and then we won't have any mistakes. And there's kind of that debate, and for some countries that have come into the markets, people have said, oh, I told you all along this was a complete mistake, the money was gonna be wasted, yields would spike, and it'll all end in tears. But, but the, the kind of the counterfactual is that, is saying that country sort of doesn't deserve to progress. And I think it's all good and well to sort of, so the, the idea of my book is that it's natural for countries to integrate with global capital, but they need to do in a robust way. And what I don't like personally is the view that you say, okay, this is a disaster, let's just push back and you just wait for the pennies to come in aid and, and don't, because if we're gonna do that, you basically sound giving up on the sustainable development goals. So the, the problem is you need private finance to achieve the sustainable development goals and for meaningful climate adaptation, but at the moment there's a problem and my sort of, so my idea is to solve that problem rather than to say let's just go back to how we were 10 years ago and that, that's a debate at the moment and it's a tricky one and I, and I haven't, you know, and it'd be interesting to know what people think because financial markets, you know, they're like, as I said, some, they're, they'll, they throw money some days, they take it away the next, it's expensive, but, but what's the alternative? We haven't got this wonderful source of calm, low-cost capital. And that, to me, is what I struggle with and, and how we can solve that. And I'd love the UK to turn up to the COP next week and say, I'm going to give Rwanda £10 billion to build solar. But I just, I just don't see it. And that's my frustration with it, if you like. So it's how can we fix the borrowing and the, bet the, the market access so it functions in, the, in these poor for these developing countries, and that, that's the difficulty, for me at least. And I think there were, you know, if you look back in history on debt, you know, the, the UK defaulted many times, Spain defaulted many times, France defaulted many times. So in our own histories, this wasn't beautifully clean and wonderful. It took a long time to get to where we are now. So hiccups along the way are, if you've got a lens on history, kind of inevitable. It's just hopefully minimizing those hiccups and learning lessons from the ups and downs. But I've kind of at least got 
a positive view that I've seen really good things happen in in Accra and in um, northern Zambia. I've seen growth and progress, and I kind of think this is going to continue. But but it's not a a, a calm linear process. It's quite jumpy, I suppose. So yeah, the main argument for the book is trying to fix to better borrowing, which and and rather than sort of a sort of shift back to a kind of like limited aid dependency, I suppose. the good academic work of the 80s and 90s, the mistakes were African solutions were ignored. Decisions were made in Washington, D.C., and in the same way now, the solutions shouldn't be coming. So you, you need to create agency on that. And, you know, for me, it would be wonderful for the African Union to play a bigger role. It'd be wonderful for more financing to go to the African Development Bank, to Africa Exim Bank, these things are absolutely, and so this will happen anyway. I think it's just a matter of time, but, but I guess the question is how does one accelerate it? And, and that's, that's the question. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's, it's, yeah it's, it's an obvious point, but it's essential because like, you kind of look after your own backyard first, and that's what European countries do. And so I think if there were meaningful discussions on improving quality of infrastructure between African countries, that would be wonderful. But it's still tricky, you know, like a lot, I traveled in May to, I went to Ghana, Benin and then Ghana. And Benin has a French heritage with the Francophone, it's part of the way moves regional currency. And then Ghana's got a slightly Anglophone heritage. And it, it's very difficult to go from Accra to Tome in Togo, to Cotonou in Benue, and to Lagos in Nigeria. Just driving four countries is a nightmare. You end up flying because it's too expensive and the borders are shut. So I find too often frust you know, collaboration between African countries being too frustrating, if that makes sense. So it's, it's, some, it's and that's something that I would love to improve. So it's, it's about trade, it's about connectivity, it's about um, some sort of regional strength. And I think these developments to the trade initiatives are wonderful. And I think we'll start paying dividends. So yeah, but, but the lesson of the disaster of the 80s and 90s were African solutions were ignored. And we do that again at our peril. Thank you so much once again for being here. Thank